ladies and gentlemen, this next hour is devoted to a discussion of the modern Silk Road. Um, so if you're in the wrong place, and this is not the session that you were uh, uh, aiming to be in, this is a good moment to leave. But if you are, I hope that we can offer you an hour in which we will learn something uh, concrete and material about what is James. certainly symbolically James. and possibly in practice China's most important foreign policy initiative of modern times. Um, my name is James Harding. I'm the director of news for the BBC. And I think wherever you sit in the world, when you look at the creation of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, the one belt, one road policy, the commitments to quote unquote Silk Road funding, you can see that potentially it is going to match the economic shift in the balance of power that we've seen over the last quarter of a century with a corresponding change to the financial uh, and, and, and economic architecture of the world. It has of course been the case that this foreign policy initiative, this change uh, to multilateral funding, has been met with a great deal of commentary. It has raised questions about the uh, future role of the RMB and its prospects as a reserve currency. It's raised questions about the kinds of conditions that should be attached to infrastructure investment. It's raised questions about the validity, the viability of the Bretton Woods financial institutions. And of course, it's raised questions about the nature of China's role in the world and its ambitions in the quarter of a century to come. But I hope that before we get, if you like, into the philosophical meaning of the modern Silk Road, that this panel will help many of us who, I imagine like me, are interested in really trying to understand how it will work. How will these new development banks and new development pools of finance work? What are the expectations of countries that are going to engage with them? And we're extremely fortunate today that we have a panel that I think is going to be able to address it um, and these questions from a, from a host of different uh, angles. Um, uh, we are uh, lucky to have not one but two prime ministers. The prime minister of Georgia, uh, Irakli Garibashvili, uh, has just joined us. And um, the prime minister of uh, Mongolia, Sakhibali Chimed. We also have from Malaysia um, the uh, Minister of International Trade, Mustafa Mohammed, and um, from Fudan University, Wu Xinbo, um, uh, and in addition, uh, Benedict Sobotka, uh, who will represent, I think, the corporate element in this as the chief executive of Eurasian Resources. Now, my experience of, uh, of Davos and the World Economic Forum is that they bring journalists like me to moderate these things for two reasons. One is that we have the attention span of a goldfish, so we like all answers to be short and concise. And the other is that we have the, the manners of a warthog. We, uh, we, we don't mind interrupting. So I hope none of my panel will mind if we interrupt to make sure the conversation is brisk and that it genuinely is a conversation. And just for members of the audience, I want you to be assured that we'll leave good time, I think 20 minutes or so at the end, to make sure views, observations, questions from the audience can be included. But if I can start, Prime Minister, can I start from, 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 from Tbilisi? When you look at the change to multilateral funding and you look at the opportunity for Georgia, in concrete terms, do you think that this initiative, the, the, the idea of a Silk Road and the idea in practical terms of an Asian infrastructure investment bank will make a meaningful difference in Georgia? Thank you very much. Dear friends, distinguished audience, I'd like to thank you for inviting us today. Uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, this is my first trip to China and to Dalian. So uh, it's a great opportunity for me to be here and uh, talk about this uh, great idea of uh, the new Silk Road concept. Uh, we very much support this idea, and I want to talk to you about the Georgia's role into this process. 
First, I have to say that uh, we have great relationship with China. Georgia and China uh, has been de developing uh, strong ties, and historically. And um, last year, the biggest investor in Georgia was from China, by the way. And FDI grew by 143% from China to Georgia. So we're developing great relationship. So China becomes, uh, is the fourth largest trade partner for Georgia, for us. So therefore, it is uh, of uh, great importance for us to have uh, strong ties with this country. And I very much support the, uh, the visionary initi initiative of, uh, of the Chinese president. I mean the Neil Silk Road, one belt, one road uh, concept. And um, as you know, Georgia, with the strategic location, can play a very significant role. What I mean, you know that Georgia has proved <clears throat> over the last 10 years or 20 years that we are a reliable transit country. We are growing our economy. We are uh, building democratic institutions. We're strengthening democratic institutions. The business is absolutely free, the media freedom, in terms of media freedom, business freedom, we're number one in the region, in the wider region, I would say. And um, I want to say a few words about uh, Georgia's recent achievements, and then I'll you know, continue about the Silk Road uh, and the Georgia's role into this pro uh, project. Last year, we signed the association agreement with the European Union. We have free trade with the European Union. We have free trade with CIS countries, including with Russia, with Turkey. And now I want to launch uh, negotiations about free trade with China. Uh, I will have a meeting with the Chinese Prime Minister uh, tomorrow, and uh, we're going to discuss about the uh, opportunities that, that exist in our region. Uh, and um, when it comes to the Silk Road and Georgia's role as a transit country, it can be uh, interesting in many sense. One thing that I want to mention is that we have proved that we are, as I mentioned, we are a reliable transit country for energy, for transport, and we have an ambition to transform our country into a logistic hub. Hmm. We would like to build a new port, a new deep sea water port with 100 million tons per year. Um, this port will be built in seven phases. And then there's a strong interest from the Chinese companies who want to be part of this project. We have uh, launched uh, negotiations about the infrastructural projects, such as the uh, construction of roads, uh, uh, bridges, and et cetera. We're talking about several billion dollar investments in Georgia. You know, you know that uh, Georgia fully supports the creation of uh, AIIB. And um, I have to tell you that two weeks ago, there was a meeting of the uh, founding uh, countries. And representatives came from uh, 50 different countries. And they elected officially the president. Mm -hmm. and by the way, I want to welcome the uh, uh, the leadership of, of, this, uh, of this bank. I'm sure that this will be a very successful uh, for, for, the, uh, for the region. And I strongly believe that there's a huge potential in this region. The region which has 60% uh, of the world population, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. and with lots of uh, untapped resources. Can, can, can I just ask you, Prime Minister, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to ask you just about the port example. Yes. Because right? a very concrete example, a very substantial one, clearly would ha it would fit that Georgian ambition of becoming a logistics hub. Is it the case that having an Asian investment, an Asian investment partner, changes the politics of it as regards Russia, as regards having a US or what would appear to be a US investment partner. Is that one of the attractions for a country like Georgia of this new financial uh, investment architecture? Well, um, 
you know, particularly in this port. I think there is a strong interest from the uh, from some American companies, also, uh, as I'm told you, from uh, Chinese companies. And uh, according to, uh, as far as I understand, they have uh, uh, interest to uh, to do this port, to realize this project together. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, you know, well, our interest is to make Georgia a place of uh, a peace, uh, a center for logistics, uh, trade, mm. and uh, you know this is our historical uh, mission. I would say. Mm. I guess my question is: Does it depoliticize within Georgia, given I think the relationship so, yes. with Russia? It would depoliticize. Okay. Um, and I want to tell you that um, uh, Georgia uh, can be a, a very effective country in terms of transit of goods from China. And I want to give you an example. The first train from China came to Georgia in nine days. It happened several months ago. It was the first test train. It means that this will actually uh, shorten the uh, the period. Uh, we're going to, you know, sp you know, how to say, uh, uh, reduce the time, uh, and we're going to use uh, reduce the how to say the distance by seven thousand kilometers. Uh, it's about. Uh, saving the money, it's about saving the time, and uh, therefore I think Georgia can be a very attractive and the shortest route uh, for China. And in general, you know, to connect uh, Asia to uh, Europe, this is the shortest route. So therefore I think that, you know, Georgia can be, uh, can play a very constructive and reliable role into this project. Great. Prime Minister, thank you very much. I'll, I'll come you. back to you in a, in a moment. Prime yeah. Minister Chimed, can I turn to you? Similarly, there will be great interest in, in, in practical terms, how this new investment infrastructure can actually make a difference in Mongolia. Um, do you see practical examples of where it will have an impact? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and thank James, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. And first of all, again, when we start talking about Asian investment, infrastructure investment, bank, these kind of things, I think it's second subject. It's more related to tools and mm. financial uh, uh, ways to achieve our goal. And first of all, we need to understand what, is, what does it mean, one belt, one road uh, definition. And everybody understands differently this term. And by me, and somebody will argue that's not right, but it's fine. Because I, first of all, I uh, think each country should have uh, their right to call their own one road, one belt. Mm -hmm. Because in Mongolian terms, it's called the New Silk Road. We call it uh, Silk uh, Step Road. Right. In Chinese meaning, it's uh, Silk Road Economic Belt. Mm -hmm. Russians call it Eurasian Economic Corridor. And each country who is presenting here in this hall also understand differently this one road, one belt uh, definition. And that's why everybody has to own their own uh, roads. And because we're not talking about particular roads. If it's not a particular road, it should be a bilateral relationship. Why these many nations, many countries will be involved in this discussion? Mm -hmm. We're not talking about particular road. Also, we're not talking about some kind of uh, build between a uh, couple countries. We're talking about network. And the network itself should be established in real meaning. And uh, for example, when we're connecting Asia with Europe in terms of fiber optic, <coughs> for example, network, there is the dozens of road connecting Asia with Europe. And that's why one road, one belt definition also should be like that. Mm. And each country, uh, I argue that uh, their road is most important, and Mongolians also can argue that, because the shortest and easiest way to connecting Asia with Europe is through Mongolia, transiting, uh, transiting uh, across Mongolia. And that's why uh, in Mongolians usually talk something like that. If you're a smart mouse, you have versed holes. You know? And that's why many routes should be established this, mm. under this uh, termination mm. of uh, one road, one belt. And uh, you asked about particular uh, approaches mm. for that. And uh, in uh, July 9th of this year, the presidents of three countries, uh, Mongolia, China, Russia, 
met in Russian city of Ufa, and we made a three lateral agreement establishing uh, this new road, mm. connecting Russia, Mongolia, and China, and five different meaning. First of all, it's uh, red road, uh, second road, third, it's oil pipeline, and uh, fourth, it's ga gasification pipeline, and fifth, is electric uh, transmission uh, road. And this five meaning we are going to uh, collaborate uh, these three countries. Mm. And I think the similar uh, things also will happen between other countries. For example, China with Georgia, China with Malaysia, I don't know. And all this is going to be one belt, one road. Mm. And uh, Asian uh, Infrastructure Development Bank is a very powerful tool for this purpose. And that's why we are now starting to talk about uh, new electrical uh, transmission lines between uh, Mongolia and China, and also uh, new uh, pipelines between these three countries. And also tomorrow is Georgian Prime Minister. I'm also going to meet with the uh, Chinese counterpart, and also Mr. Vitkliakitsyan, and also we're going to deal and discuss also about this subject. And a uh, particular project is already developed, especially involving uh, private uh, sector companies. And uh, I, I think we will be in good shape to establish uh, these uh, new roads. And combining with other countries' new roads, mm. I think under this meaning, we will going to have uh, this new Silk Road. And we start, from the beginning, we are starting to feel like this is the particular road, the correct one, uh, the most the, uh, route. I think this idea is going to have very challenging. And the other countries will uh, also discuss and argue with that. That's why it's not alternative to each other. Mm. It's combination of and establishing big network around this idea, this definition. It's the most important thing. I, uh, I appreciate that. And I, and I really appreciate the point you're making about it not being one road or one belt a, a network. W while we are teasing away at that, there's some people who say it's not really a road at all that there's a rather romantic idea people have of the, whether you call it the Silk Road or the Step Road or even a corridor, but actually these are really infrastructure and particularly commodity investments. And they are going to be possibly not even roads, more like holes in the ground. From a Mongolian point of view, do you think that the primary areas of investment are going to be around energy and commodities? Or do you think they are going to be around transport and infrastructure networks? Uh, for example, Mongolia, uh, very plenty of natural resources. We have about more than 80 different natural uh, minerals resources. Mm. It's mm. old Mendeleev, this table is out there. Uh, over 6,000 <laughs> deposit areas, the estimated wealth of uh, about 1.3 trillion US dollars. Mm, mm. And that's why we have wealth. And other countries has also financial power and also know-how, technology. And the good mix of this wealth and uh, with technology, I think this is the whole idea of connecting each other, mm. establishing this network. And that's why, again, these uh, Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank's activities, uh, plus uh, collaboration between uh, countries, this is just the powerful tools to achieving, uh, to connecting, to establishing this uh, very important network between countries, distributing this wealth, distributing this technology, distributing these financial resources among the part, uh, parties. That's the most important thing in, to, in, in terms of establishing One Belt, One Road concept. Terrific. Prime Minister, thank you. I'd, I'd like to come back to you. I'd like to have a discussion a little later on about the geopolitics of this. But I'm going to turn now to Minister Mustafa Mohammed. Um, we really appreciate you being here. And, and to get the perspective from Malaysia is really interesting because, of course, the kinds of uh, the, the involvement of Malaysia is in some ways, in some ways different. How, how do you see, A, this policy, but B, also the opportunities for economic cooperation that change as a result of it? Thank you, James. Uh, I do trade and investments for my country, and uh, I would like to answer this uh, in two parts. Firstly, the national perspective, my country. Secondly, the regional, which is ASEAN. Uh, for Malaysia, uh, China is our number one trading partner, and Malaysia is the biggest trading partner for China in ASEAN. Among the 10, we're number one. So you can see 
and how important this is uh, for Malaysia. We've enjoyed hundreds of years of close collaboration, plus we've got a significant uh, Chinese majority who speak Mandarin and all that. So when we've got what we call the comprehensive strategic partnership uh, with China, and we see this uh, as an opportunity to further strengthen ties. I mean, uh, very strong trade ties, investments. Uh, incidentally, um, uh, for every dollar that China has in Malaysia, we've got six dollars here in China. We have more Malaysian money in China than there is Chinese money in Malaysia. Ratio, ratio six to one. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is an opportunity to balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, get more Chinese money into Malaysia. Yeah? Now six dollars here, our, my, our people's money here, and one dollar in Malaysia. So this initiative is an opportunity for us to get more investments from China. So from the, from the strict uh, national perspective, this is uh, very important because uh, we are building upon a relationship which is already there for many, many years to raise it to an even higher level. So we are excited about this. Um, uh, it created a lot of interest in my country uh, and we believe uh, this will further uh, uh, strengthen ties between uh, Malaysia and China. That's the national perspective. Regional, uh, and uh, this year we chair ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN is, you know, is a grouping of uh, 10 countries, and uh, Malaysia chairs ASEAN. I just chaired the ASEAN Economic Minister's meeting, and we had a meeting with um, our counterparts from eight other countries, including China. And we see this as an opportunity uh, to further uh, strengthen ties. Uh, ASEAN is growing rapidly, average 5.1% in recent years. This year, probably a small dip. Uh, but by and large, ASEAN is a dynamic region, 625 million people, uh, growing more than 5% per annum in recent years, a growing middle class. Uh, Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world, 25 million. Uh, there are in ASEAN rich countries and poor countries, good mix. And many of these countries are looking for opportunities to increase uh, investments and also <coughs> improve infrastructure. Uh, so some of us are looking at this as, as an opportunity to complement what the World Bank and ADB, I mean, these institutions have been there for a long time. But we know that, uh, you know, it, that, that's not sufficient. Uh, there's an estimate that, you know, there's a financing gap of probably about $500 billion in the next five, ten years, uh, as far as infrastructure is concerned. So in almost every ASEAN country, uh, there, there's a policy to beef up infrastructure development. Uh, and ASEAN uh, member states are looking at this initiative as an opportunity to to step up and to, to, uh, to, to provide the gap, the financing gap that's needed uh, to, to, to increase, to improve infrastructure. So that's how we're looking at this initiative. That's the regional perspective. And of course, there's maritime and also the road, road of course, land. Uh, maritime is, uh, is, is the sea. And we are in this unique position. We are in both. We, mm -hmm. on, on land, we are Laos with a border with China, Vietnam. Uh, so we're interested in that. That will be the uh, one, one, one road, you know, one, uh, one belt, one road, yeah, and the other is a maritime. Yeah. And uh, for me, in Malaysia, we already have connections. Uh, There's a Chinese company which has already bought 40% of one port in the Malaysian state. Uh, and the reason why they, they did that yeah. you know, more than a year ago uh, is to, uh, uh, well, to, for, to probably to support this initiative. So it is already happening, and next week there's a big delegation uh, coming from a uh, province in China to one province in Malaysia uh, to talk about uh, the construction of ports and, you know, and uh, maritime park. So it is already happening. So in summary, um, we have been having strong ties with China uh, and we see this as opportunity to further uh, enhance bilater bilateral cooperation. That's how I look at it from my point of view in Malaysia, but that's also how my ASEAN colleagues are looking at the one belt, one road initiative. So we're quite excited. Uh, and, and can I ask you, um, Minister, you know, I, I, as I've said to the Georgian Prime Minister, I can see from a Georgian point of view that an, a big level of Asian investment in something like a port could actually depoliticize, take some of the tension out of a big infrastructure project in that part of the world. Certainly in the UK, where you've seen high levels of Chinese investment, there's, there has been a body of opinion that's been suspicious of it and, and questioned whether or not China's investment into big infrastructure projects uh, raised questions about controls, control in the economy. Given the relationship between Malaysia and China, what, what are the issues there for, for the Malaysian government and, and a Malaysian public opinion? We've been uh, an open economy in manufacturing. 
uh, you can have 100% foreign ownership, for example, and mm -hmm. we have a fairly liberal environment uh, in services as well. Uh, and uh, Chinese have been in Malaysia for a long time. For example, in construction, uh, Chinese have been, I mean, I talk about trade, about investments, mm -hmm. but it's also this construction contracts. The Chinese the companies have been winning uh, lots of contracts in Malaysia. Uh, the second bridge uh, linking Penang Island to the mainland was uh, partly uh, built and, and financed by the Chinese. So, uh, we've had, uh, and there's quite a number of uh, companies from China involved in property development in Malaysia. So because of this uh, historical relationship, uh, uh, I'm not saying that there's no problem at all, but uh, probably it's not, not like, say, UK, where you come from, uh, and some of the countries perhaps, yeah? because we, we have had uh, six, seven hundred years of uh, close ties with, with China. So it's not a major issue in Malaysia. Well, that leads me happily, Professor Wu Xinbo, into, into the, the question, really, which is, what is China's motivation with the, the Silk Road and the investment banks? What do you think is the longer-term plan? Well, uh, um, I think this study with China's uh, search for uh, opportunities to promote its um, overseas trade and investment when the Chinese economy reaches a point that you really need to um, readjust, restructure your economy and uh, rely less on domestic uh, uh, market and promote your overseas investment. Uh, and also, uh, domestically, there, there's a problem of the uh, uh, production surplus. So you really, for example, we have built a huge network of highways and high-speed rails. Now, so we have the experience and uh, construction capacity. Once we finish doing this, what should we do, right? Naturally, you look around to find uh, new opportunities. So I, I would say that's, that this idea comes from you know, the um, uh, China's search for a new uh, model of its economic development. And also, we, we very quickly find out that we cannot do the traditional things when we try to promote overseas uh, trade investment by simply signing the traditional free trade agreement or the investment treaty with others. Because you know, many of our neighbors, they are not uh, developed economies. Uh, and uh, you really help them to stimulate uh, their trade and their need for investment. So the, the, I think the, 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 the real cutting edge is really to help them uh, develop their uh, um, underdeveloped infrastructure so that can promote their economic growth. That will you know, uh, uh, create more opportunities for trade and investment uh, uh, needs uh, from China. So basically, this is a kind of you know, uh, win-win situation. And also, I think um, if uh, there is a kind of a geopolitical dimension of this consideration, is that um, if China is going to uh, uh, sustain its uh, peace and stability in its neighborhood, you really need to help its uh, neighbors to develop the economy, uh, to stabilize the regional situation. So that uh, requires uh, 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 development as a key to solve many of the traditional uh, 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 challenges to stability and security in this region. It's, it's, it's really interesting, if I can summarize those two points, the argument that says China's own investment phase begins to slow, it has colossal construction capacity, where is gonna take that? And therefore these investments serve not only those international economies but its own, but also that economic growth in its neighborhood mm -hmm. help deal with tensions, help deal with some of the diplomatic challenges it faces. Mm -hmm. Of course there's a different lens, isn't there, that's sometimes put on this whole policy out of Washington, mm -hmm. which is, this is an attempt, not just by China, in fact by many countries across Asia, to try and address what is seen as an imbalance in the international financial institutions and, and recognize the importance of China and other Asian countries within that multilateral funding context. And it's part of a bigger change, which is about China's recognition in the world. You didn't mention those things. Is that, is that something that is imposed from the outside, also felt internally? Well, when we think about Banner Road, um, we didn't uh, have the objective of you know, um, challenging the existing multilateral 
international financial institutions. Uh, but I wouldn't say that when China started uh, to pursue, let's say, the AIB uh, Silk Road Fund, it will not have any impact on the current existing uh, US-led uh, multilateral institutions. Um, on the positive side, it will help uh, uh, complement uh, the um, infra infrastructure financing gap uh, 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 that mm -hmm. many Asian countries are facing. Uh, for example, uh, today, I think World Bank and ADB can only provide 2% of the uh, infrastructure front that Asian countries need. So there is a big gap, and China is trying to, to fill the gap. So in that sense, AIB can be complementary to you know, World Bank and ADB in this sense. On the other hand, it will also create some competition and mm -hmm. even pressure. That is, people have all blamed that ADB, they have been slow, efficient, uh, not doing a good job in providing enough fund, funding for infrastructure development. So when China started uh, its own project like AIB along with other countries, and also Silk Road Fund, that will get um, ADB to think more seriously about improving uh, its uh, decision making process, uh, project designing, and focusing more on investment infrastructure. So yes, there will be some impact. But in the long term, I think this will make the existing uh, multilateral institutions uh, more efficient and more uh, competitive. Can I, um, spontaneous applause is always welcome. Um, but Benedict Sabotka, can I, can I just take on that point? Because some people will look at the investment world now and think there's just a plethora of different multilateral investment institutions. You know, we've talked a bit about the AIB, we've talked a touch about the new Silk Road funds, there's the, there's the new BRICS development fund. From a very practical point of view, sitting where you sit, chief executive of a company that's had really substantial investments, take Kazakhstan, will you talk, talk us through in practical terms how the, the changes are making a difference on the ground? Thank you, James. Um, I wanted to slightly come back to the virgin point before I come to your question. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. um, the new Silk Road initiative is a, a huge mm -hmm. understatement. Mm -hmm. A huge understatement, in my opinion. And I like to, when I'm invited for dinners in China, I like to give a toast. Mm -hmm. And I would like to give the toast to the word China in Chinese, which is Chungguo, which, if I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> halfway at least, means yeah. the Middle Kingdom. Mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. actually, it is in a way, the center of the world. It has been for the last 2,000 years, the last 100 years were the exception to the rule. The last 1,900 years were the rule. So we're actually just coming back to what China actually always was, which is one of these centers, if not the center of the world. And so for me, it's much bigger than just logistics or building infrastructure, building roads, building projects. This is much more about moving from being an economic superpower um, as a country alone, standalone, into being a regional superpower. Um, and in the course of that, projecting geopolitical influence across the region as well. I was originally, I was born in Germany, so I can understand how a country that is, has an economic influence and has had for many years, is now slowly coming to terms with the fact that it also has to take some political and geopolitical responsibility for the region it operates, and obviously on a, at a much smaller, smaller scale. I think the unwilling hegemon, I think they call it, in The, in the Economist. Um, for us, I think what is, what is unique and what is very different to what we've seen in the past is the way how systematic the government in China goes about implementing it. And here I talk particularly about the institutions that have been put in place and how effective these Chinese institutions support the private sector and the parastatal sector in implementing projects. Particularly, I would like to mention Chinese Exim Bank, Chinese Development Bank. Sino Shore, a plethora of state-owned companies from uh, MCC, um, NFC, engineering companies that build projects rolled, China Rail, China Hydro, um, a large amount of private companies that come in the tailwind of those state-owned companies. Um, it's about the scale and the effectiveness of the execution that I think is a, is a real game changer. Um, for us, we have, we employ about 75,000 people around the world. 
um, in the resource sector, which probably is not the sexiest industry to be in at the moment, I'm sure everyone will know. Um, for us, it's a reality. When China gets a cold, right, we got pneumonia um, because we so much depend on Chinese consumers buying our products, be it in cobalt, be it in copper and iron or aluminium. Um, it's all about China. Most of our commodities we're on are starting to trade in RMB. So we're already seeing today what I think other industries are going to see very soon is that it's all going to be about China because it's such a major player, such an enormous factor in the world. Uh, so again, coming back to the Silk Road point, yeah, it's, it's, it's much bigger than just, just an idea or a romantic idea. Um, and to talk about what it specifically means, we just actually, and that's why I was so impressed because I'm still under the impression of the meetings we had last, last week in China in the presence of the Kazakh president and the Chinese uh, president. We signed, as part of this new Silk Road initiative, we signed investment projects um, sponsored by CDB, Exim Bank, Sinusure, and others um, for infrastructure and industrial projects in Kazakhstan and in Africa, uh, over $2.5 billion. Um, and I could, I could feel, I mean, those were proud of 20 other projects worth <laughs> over $25 billion just for Kazakhstan, $25 billion. That is a, as a huge number, even for China, of outward investment policy sponsored, supported by policy banks. Um, for us, it means we can actually now build projects much faster uh, with the available funding that may not have been available at this speed. Um, and of course, a lot of those products will go back into China. So today we sell about 20% of our materials into China. Um, that number will go up, it will increase. Uh, so for us, the, the Silk Road, it's in, particularly in Kazakhstan, it's a reality. 20% of Kazakhs export go into China, 20% of the oil that's being produced in Kazakhstan is produced by Chinese companies. So um, yeah. when I hear people talk about how this is going to happen and how it's going to come, it's, it's here. It's already there. And, and can, can I ask you, one of, the, one of the questions that surrounded the um, development funding that's coming out of Asia and, and, and led by China has been about the nature of the conditions attached um, over the past 20, probably a few, 20 years, probably a few more than that, there's been this growing debate about the extent to which the institutions headquartered in Washington have sought to use infrastructure investment as a lever for issues around the environment, um, social justice, uh, other forms of rights. Is it the case that the kind of infrastructure investment you'll get from China or Asia is less onerous when it comes to those kinds of conditions? James, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. I think the standards that are required by the Chinese policy banks are very similar to the international policy banks, if not identical. And in some cases, particularly when it comes to environmental requirements, they might even be, be stricter. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't say this. I think the big difference is, is in, in, in business, we call it the getting it done factor. Right. Um, our experience with some of the international institutions has been they don't always get things done at the speed that the private businesses need to get things done. Whereas in China, we get things done. I think that's the major, the major difference in, in the international institutions and, and, the, and the Chinese institutions that are supporting in a very systematic way the, um, uh, the implementation of the Silk Road. Interesting, all right. I'm, um, I'd like to uh, pause for a second because if, if Listening to all of you, actually what's really striking is the level of enthusiasm and excitement around A, the initiative, and B, the, the mechanisms behind it. Um, I just wanted to go back to, we'd like to have the two prime ministers here, I just wanted to go back and ask you a little bit about the geopolitics of it. And to give us, if you like, a, a very specific view from Tbilisi, from Ulaanbaatar, because I think it's often the case that when you see the, the expression of economic power in the, in the form that, uh, that, that Mr. Sabotka was talking about, there's a presumption that this is met with some suspicion, whether it's in Georgia or in, in Mongolia. And I just wanted to understand from you how you see that, how you see managing the relationship now in effect between Beijing, Moscow and Washington. And can I start with you, Prime Minister? Well, thank you for this uh, <coughs> interesting question. So that's why I said, you know, uh, that uh, we want to make our country a place of understanding, a place of, uh, you know, negotiations and peace. And that's why we said that, you know, we want to transform our country into a 
into a hub, into a center, mm. where Chinese or American or other countries or, or other companies you know, would invest in. And this would be beneficial for everyone. And um, because if you look at, at the map, if you look at Georgia's location, you know, this is the crossroad. We're at the crossroad and we're the shortest route, as I said, between Asia and Europe. So therefore, I think we should be very flexible. One thing is that, you know, we have this uh, political vector that we want to get closer to the EU and uh, that's why we signed this association agreement, but it doesn't limit us to work closely to develop strong economic trade ties with the Asian countries, to have pragmatic and, uh, I would say, strong economic trade relations with Russia. And if you look at our policy, the policy of the new government, which I represent, we have been very pragmatic with respect to, uh, to the neighborhood especially with Russia. And when I said that we're pragmatic, you know, we fully understand the responsibility of Georgia in the region. Because if um, Georgia is destabilized, it destabilized the whole region, I mean the Caucasus region, and this corridor that we're talking about. Mm. So therefore, I, I think this is essential that we <coughs> agree on one thing, that we need Stability. I, I, we need I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just, I'm really interested to know whether or not you think that a strong economic relationship with China and Asia more generally, but particularly with China, will over time prove to be more valuable in managing the relationship with Russia than, than the, the EU or US relationships? Well, I, I think, you know, we can find many, you know, mutually beneficial, you know, uh, interests. And um, this could be one of the reasons. And I think this would, this could help uh, de-escalate the tension, or as, as you said, depoliticize, mm -hmm. right? If you build a port, let's yeah. say, if you have a, a Chinese company, we should, uh, we should say that it opens up uh, new opportunities. We have a big player, a huge player in the region, and it uh, kind of uh, creates um, a balance. And, uh, and here I strongly believe that this is the mission and this is the role of Georgia. Mm -hmm. By the way, I want to uh, add a few words that last year at the uh, UN General Assembly, 69th UN, uh, General Assembly, I announced about the uh, establishment of a Tbilisi Silk Road Forum. Mm. By the way, for the first time in October 15th and 16th, we're going to hold a very high level uh, international uh, well, Tbilisi Silk Road Forum. And let me take this opportunity and invite you all, so you're more than welcome to join us. Mm -hmm. We have about 200 delegates, 200 uh, big delegation from China, about 200 <laughs> members. Uh, many European states, uh, other countries uh, from Central Asian countries. So I think this will be another, you know, opportunity to talk about the uh, potential, to talk about the opportunities that exist in our country. And I also I want to tell you that in March we signed uh, uh, the uh, cooperation agreement mm -hmm. already with the Silk Road uh, Fund. Yeah. So we're developing this stronger ties. That's great. Well, firstly, let me give a quick uh, plug to a visit to Tbilisi, one of James. the most lovely cities in the world and a beautiful country. Appreciate it. Prime Minister Chime, okay. can, I can I ask you the same question? You've got some sure. experience. And uh, Mongolia is second biggest landlocked country in the world after Kazakhstan. And we always thought this is our biggest disadvantage. But apparently it's becoming our biggest advantage now hmm. because Mongolia is now surrounded by two big oceans. In the north, it's Russian economy, eighth in the world, and biggest supplier, one of the biggest suppliers in the world. In the south, we have second economy of the world, and biggest consumer and also supplier mm. in the world. And that's why it's also a good advantage. Mm. But again, you raised about the issues of geopolitics, uh, etc. 
uh, we have to consider about it. Because yeah. as country, when you're surrounded by two big uh, economy, two big neighbors, of course there is the huge influence. And this is our priority of our foreign policy. But also we have uh, foreign policy, it's called third neighbor policy. And the third neighbor, we uh, assume that any country except our two uh, direct uh, neighbors. Mm -hmm. And that's why Japan, that's why EU, US, it's okay. under third neighbor uh, umbrella policy. And also we need to consider again one uh, very important factor in our region because not only this Asian investment, uh, infrastructure investment bank, but also Chinese also, mm. the, uh, I'm sorry, Japanese also trying to also play very actively in this region. Mm. And just recently, uh, Prime Minister uh, <laughs> Japan uh, Shinzo Abe also announced that uh, about also 110 billion US dollars investment also going to distribute through JPEG and JICA something like these organizations also investing in uh, regional infrastructure development. And that's why this kind of opportunities also giving us some kind of good balance to uh, keep uh, between our neighbors. And also, as you uh, mentioned, that international institutions uh, like World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and other institutions, that's the, uh, giving us some kind of confidence that we will be in pretty good shape uh, balancing all this. Powers, uh, uh, that's very interesting. And clearly this Japanese element is a really, is, an, is, a, is a very interesting feature of this. Uh, I said that we'd make sure we have good 15 minutes for um, questions, comments, and so I want to make sure that we honour that. Can I abuse my position though to start with? I was having an interesting conversation with Chen Guo Gan just before we started. He's the Vice President of the China Minshan Investment Corporation. Uh, and Mr Chen, you've got an investment in Indonesia that's in exactly this territory. I wondered whether you could talk from a Chinese private sector point of view about this policy and, um, and, and how it's changing your thinking uh, um, uh, at China Minshan. Okay. Sorry, I speak Chinese. Okay, good. Uh, So I listened to the uh, remarks from ministers and uh, prime ministers uh, on one road and one silk uh, initiative. As for the private companies, uh, we are beginning to see more opportunities. So as a matter of fact, the private companies in China has a history of only about 30 years after China stopped, started the opening up policy to the outside. However, at present, the private companies uh, takes about 65% of the economic total volume. So as a result, as mentioned just now, we are facing the overcapacity of uh, production. And therefore, the uh, One Road, uh, One Belt initiative has provided us uh, with more opportunities, uh, showing us the directions for the future development, as mentioned just now. It's not a matter of uh, one specific road. It is uh, indicating the direction for the future development, how we can invest and in what way and where we can invest. So this is what we are more interested in. If we, just like what happened before, uh, now uh, invest as a single entities, it would not be as effective as we uh, have a collective power, collective strength. Our company, the Mingsheng Investment Company, has a very short history. We hope that we can set up a platform on which not only the private companies can pull their resources, but also find opportunities by working together to go global. So that is to say, if uh, individual companies uh, go abroad to invest, it's uh, not uh, as uh, powerful as uh, the investment uh, through the collective power. As a result, we will be more risk resistant. So One Belt, One Silk initiative, uh, to some extent, has uh, 
provided us with some more opportunities, and at the same time, it is also a kind of a safeguard for our investment. Recently, we have decided to invest in about 500,000 American dollars to set up an industry park. About 10 shareholders are very interested in this. They have decided to join this big program. So we hope that we can do this project well by working together with the Chinese government and local governments and also the local communities. We hope that we can produce a good program so that more private companies are interested in it or get interested in it. Um, questions, comments, points of view, I'd ask you just one thing. Would you just say who you are and the organization you represent? Yes, madam, there's a lady there. And then there's a gentleman at the back. Thank you very much. A question to Professor Wu. Uh, in recent years, China is uh, uh, trying to promote the construct of uh, railway networks overseas, and uh, it is the same to Japan. Uh, there is a competition between China and Japan in terms of the construction of railways. However, it seems that uh, both are losers in the competition. So is it possible for us to have a kind of a cooperation rather than fierce competition between the two countries? Thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't hear your name. Uh, Good news. Uh, Professor Wu, I'm going to come to you in a second. There's a gentleman okay. at the back who also had a question. Mm -hmm. Did he? No, he's now doing something else. Okay. Let's do um, railway competition between China and Japan, an example of infrastructure investment in which no one seems to win. Is that right? Uh, how we can make this a win-win situation, right? Well, uh, <coughs> this is very interesting because um, in the past, Japan was the uh, leader in East Asia in terms of trade and uh, investment. Uh, but in the last 10 years, uh, China owed to Japan in uh, forging closer economic relations with many of our neighbors, including FTA with ASEAN countries, uh, now promoting infrastructure development. And Japan tried to uh, catch up and compete with China. So now wherever China goes, Japan follows and uh, compete with China. Um, sometimes, uh, of course, uh, this will uh, provide better opportunities for the host country because they have two, you know, you compete with each other, they can get the, uh, a better offer from either of you. Um, but your comment raised a good question whether in the future uh, this com competition can also become some uh, uh, coordination, cooperation, collaboration. Uh, I think it depends on the political willingness. For example, in the national market, um, China and India, we used to compete for the construction uh, uh, contracts in Africa or, or, or Middle East. And I think there, there, there are more than one cases in which the two countries decided to cooperate rather than compete with each other. So that's a win-win situation for both sides. So uh, I think theoretically, yes, this opportunity exists. But uh, uh, in reality, uh, that depends on uh, a lot of factors, particularly the uh, political relations uh, between two countries. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Madam, yes, there's a lady here. So I'm from the Institute of International Economic Cooper Trade Cooperation of the Ministry of Commerce. So just now, I listened to your comments on one silk, one uh, silk road, uh, one road, one silk economic uh, belt. I heard a lot about uh, the economic cooperation. I think it's more important for us to get back to the intention, the origin of this uh, uh, 
important initiative. We hope that, uh, according to the Chinese uh, government, uh, so in the uh, coming 10 years, the trade volume between China and uh, the neighboring countries will be doubled to about 2.5 trillion American dollars. So that is to say, in this initiative, trade is a very important issue. China will not only export, but also import with the focus on the quality. So I hope more attention can be uh, directed to this. And we also hope that we can see more inputs from our neighboring countries. The gentleman at the back who's got his hand up too. So I'm from China First Finance newspaper. My question is to the Prime, Prime Minister of Georgia. Just now, you talked about the deep water, water port uh, with a capacity of 100 million tons. I would like to know what is the money to be invested in it and which companies, uh, Chinese companies, are more interested in it. Thank you. Uh, I'm just in order to make sure that we have time to finish up properly. I'm going to leave those questions yes. there. Um, if I may, Prime Minister, I'm going to ask you to answer that first. Um, and then, um, I, if I can, I'll ask Minister uh, Mustafa Mohammed just to address the question about trade. The, the, the waiting has been around investment in this conversation, but just the trade point. Prime Minister of Georgia. Well, thank you for your question. Um, regarding the deep sea water port in Anaklia, the Black Sea that we're going to build. Uh, we're talking about the uh, private investments uh, of local companies, mm -hmm. Georgian companies, mm -hmm. uh, American companies, Chinese companies, uh, big companies uh, from China, such as uh, uh, China Power and CRCC, if I'm not uh, wrong. Uh, they're going to uh, invest into this port. It's a $5 billion uh, you know, uh, investment in total. As I said, it's um, 100 mil uh, million uh, tons uh, per year. It, has it will have the capacity. But um, we're going to develop this port in seven phases. So um, this is the uh, private investment, as I said. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Mr. Mohammed, the, uh, the, the point that Madam Shing made about trade is clearly quite a forceful one. Yeah. We'll just address it from a Malaysia's point of view. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, a couple of points. Firstly, uh, an overall um, uh, comment, which is it's got to be win-win trade or investments. I mean, it's got to be mutually beneficial. That's very important. The balance of benefits uh, has got to be uh, uh, quite uh, as, as balanced as possible. I think that's a very important point. Uh, benefits China and benefits all of us. Uh, that way you can get buy-in. On trade, yes, indeed. I mean, we want China to import from, it's not just China exporting, also China importing. But besides that, um, there's investments, of course, tourism, you know, there's connectivity, uh, people to people, young people, universities. So it is, it, is, it is more than trade. It is more than exports. It is imports, investments, tourism, people to people, culture, physical connectivity. So, I mean, the, 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 the impact is not limited uh, only to, and it's not just economic. <laughs> I mean, it's more than economic, socioeconomic. So that's why uh, there's some exciting, uh, uh, you know, possibilities uh, going forward. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that's why there is this excitement. Uh, one has got to look beyond uh, trade and one has got to look beyond economic uh, co and commerce. It's, it's more than that. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I said that we'd finish promptly at 4.30 and we will. One of the um, odd requirements uh, of uh, the World Economic Forum is to try to summarize what can be, an his, as, as Mr. Sobotka rightly pointed out, an historic change. And I think that, or at least I hope that, what you've heard here this afternoon, both in the level of support that we've heard from the Prime Minister of Georgia and Mongolia, from the Minister um, of Trade and Investment from Malaysia, but also in concrete terms uh, from private sector executives, people like Mr. Chungor Gang from, uh, uh, from Benedict Sobotka, is a sense that, uh, led by China, an Asian wave of infrastructure <laughs> is going to have a fundamental impact on not just 
operations on the ground, very large uh, uh, infrastructure projects, and new routes of trade, but also the diplomatic relations between uh, uh, countries that stretch all the way from here to, to the um, borders of Europe. I think that uh, if there is one single thing to take away is this phrase that uh, we've heard again and again, this sense that in each case it has to be an economic win-win and the new reality of being able to exploit competition in the uh, multilateral investment world uh, in order that each country uh, and private sector companies too can pursue those investment opportunities. Thank you to all of you for sparing the time this afternoon. I know there's a great many demands on your time uh, here in Dalian uh, these next uh, few days. We really appreciate you spending the time. But thank you in particular, I hope, to our extremely uh, informative panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.